off to the races. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, I had started to say that HMMs are a foundational tool um, in terms of processing many types of data for us, um, data coming from Ethica as well as from other sources. They are uh, further a really good tool for understanding some of the algorithms which we're going to be using later um, uh, within today's sessions and in subsequent days. So um, uh, I, I mentioned uh, hidden Markov models are only arguably a system science technique. They're linear and as a linear system um, uh, supports reductive reasoning about it in the sense that um, uh, the response of the system to uh, uh, a sum of, of different inputs is simply the sum of the system's response to each input. Um, it's, it's very arguable whether these lie within, truly within system science, but it's certainly a dynamic modeling technique. It characterizes the evolving, char the evolving nature of a system over time. Um, and like system science models, it posits an evolving latent situation that's not directly generally observable and ambiguous observations, observations that are themselves often noisy, uh, incomplete, that is often sparse or, um, or not available at all times, and often um, have big ranges of uncertainty associated with them. Um, uh, they offer these mechanisms, uh, HMMs are a key tool in our toolbox that offers inferencing for an underlying situation at a point in time um, and support parameter estimation uh, for, for our models, our system science models, agent-based models and system dynamics models. Um, HMMs are more restrictive than the system science tools that they inform um, and so they're, they're not um, the final step. Often we incorporate the results into a bigger model um, and I'll, I'll comment some about how we do this. Uh, in this or future lectures. Um, but we will be walking through some HMM algorithms that I hope will lend some appreciation for, um, uh, for some of the ways in which um, these, the more sophisticated tools we'll be seeing this afternoon operate. Okay, so HMMs depict a common situation, a situation that um, should be familiar to many of you. Um, where we have some underlying situation um, uh, that we can characterize as, as composed of a series of, of categorical states. So maybe we have an individual who's ill or not ill with respect to, say, flu, or with respect to measles. Um, maybe we have an individual who has diabetes, uh, prediabetes, or is normal glycemic because it has a has a normal blood, blood trigger functioning. Or maybe our categorical states are, is a person standing, sitting, lying down, or engaged uh, in some sort of more vigorous activity, or for the final categorical state, maybe they're not carrying the phone at all. Hmm? Um, here, we have a set of states, but more than that, we have some evolution amongst those states over time I might go from a sitting to a standing posture. Or at the end of the day, gratefully, from a standing posture to a sitting posture, mm -hmm. or even to a lying down posture. Mm -hmm. um, now, this underlying situation um, often is only incompletely observed by empirical observations. And Typically, we'll have one or more series of observations that might measure our underlying state. Maybe their blood glucose readings spot blood glucose readings at random times, uh, not, not fasting ones, but just spot ones, and as such have a great deal of uncertainty. Maybe we have multiple types of observations. Maybe we have accelerometer data, but also gyroscope data, for example, that might give clues as to my, my sitting status. Maybe when it comes to uh, trying to figure out whether the phone screen at a given time is on or off, we have data about when the phone screen turns on, when it turns off, and Ethica is running, but we also have other data like battery records 
which indicate is Ethica recording data right now? Maybe the phone is off, for example, and Ethica is not recording data at all. Or maybe the app has been evicted from memory, and, and so there's periods without, without recording. So here, observations of one or more types are ambiguous. They're noisy, they're sparse, and they're generally insufficient to conclusively identify a state. If someone gave me a blood glucose test right now, it might give me some understanding of my glycemic state, but it's very ambiguous because it's at a random, random point in the day. Um, and uh, in general, when we're dealing with system science methods, often we have a lot of these observations. So um, uh, there might be observations, for example, which, uh, which are based on accelerometer or gyroscope that suggest a low level of activity right now Maybe that's indicative of me lying down, but maybe it's just a particularly quiescent point in my um, uh, peripatetic meanderings around the room. Okay? Um, so here, often anyone reading is very ambiguous. Uh, it's very uncertain. But we'd like to infer, not just from that one reading in isolation, but from multiple readings, what's going on. But more fundamentally yet, we'd like to know, not just from the data themselves, but from, in terms of the underlying states, if I'm in a certain state now, if I'm standing, it's very unlikely in the next second I'll be lying down. It could happen. One could think of, of you know, traumatic, traumatic occurrences which could lead to that, but it's unlikely that I would then spring up within one second. I, I, I suspect you enjoy seeing me you know, attempt this, but the point is that, that there's a certain regularity of the underlying system that limits our interpretation of what's going on right now. Um, it would be implausible to posit that you know, I'm engaged in uh, half second alternations of sitting, uh, of, of lying down and standing you know, for four minutes on end. Um, although it would be calisthenically invigorating, um, <laughs> it's, it's quite implausible. And therefore, we know something from the observations, but we also know something. Our understanding is constrained by the plausible transitioning that's posited between these different states. Similarly, um, you know, if we were to understand, for example, someone's smoking behavior, um, from imperfect cues, imperfect e bits of evidence. For example, are they outside right now or not? Um, are they engaged in, uh, in, in sort of low, low levels of physical activity, none at all, or high levels of physical activity right now? Those might clue us into what's going on right now, but there's also a certain regularity to smoking habits that are unlikely to suggest someone is, is uh, you know, smoking right now and then um, uh, not engaged in the smoking behavior uh, two minutes from now and then engaged in smoking behavior in, the, in another two minutes uh, again. It, generally speaking, we, we have a certain continuity to the underlying state for many conditions. And HMMs help us interpret that. So HMMs um, help us address certain key research questions. Given a positive situation like this, where we have these categorical sets of states, we can use HMMs to ask, for example, what are the set of latent categorical states underlying the system? We can actually try to infer those, for example. In other cases, we have a sense of, of what the states are. And we're interested, for example, in knowing how often are transitions made between these states? How often, for example, is someone alternating between smoking and e-cigarette use? Um, or engaged in change of posture involving their day-to-day -day routine? What's the balance of time spent in these states? Uh, how much time are they spending using e-cigarettes compared to using cigarettes, for example, compared to using neither modality? Um, oh. What's the categorical state I'm in at the current time? I'm interested right now, I'm in an outbreak state with respect to foodborne illness in Saskatoon. Well, that's 
Okay, that sounds really bad. Um, there's some fine restaurants nearby, ladies and gentlemen. I recommend, I recommend Aiden's Kitchen, um, which is close by, and um, uh, please don't let any of this dissuade you um, from from that. But you know, is Saskatoon right now in the context of a food borne outbreak or not? I would argue I've no indication of that, but. We might be interested in knowing that uh, before um, setting out for, uh, for, for dinner. Or we might want to know retrospectively, a month ago was Saskatoon in a foodborne illness uh, outbreak um, looking, at, looking at data. And finally, we might ask, given all the evidence we've had, what's kind of the most likely historical state about what's gone on over time that has led us to this current point? What was our transitioning between different states. So um, hidden Markov models provide us a way of gaining insight into exactly these sort of questions. And they formalize this general description here of, of a sort of our, our common needs. Um, we have a set of categorical states. In this case, the phone the phone is on my person, I'm carrying the phone, we might say informally, versus it's off my person, it's sitting there. If it's on my person, why might I be interested in something like that? Because if it's on my person, the data that it's picking up about where, uh, about where it is, for example, is representative of where I am, right? How close is it to my prosthetic limb? That indicates how close I am to my prosthetic limb. Um, uh, the phone is recording large amounts of physical activity that might be indicative of me engaging in large amounts of physical activity. Um, by contrast, if the phone is off my person, it may be recording no physical activity, but that doesn't mean that, that I, as its owner, are engaged in no physical activity. It might be not near the prosthetic limb, but perhaps its owner is out um, you know, using the prosthetic limb with, uh, and an outing with friends. Uh, I just didn't bring the phone uh, along with me or sitting on a counter in my, in my home while I'm with friends elsewhere in the home. Um, and, and where I am might be separate from where the phone is if it's not on my person. So we're often interested in terms of processing ethica data, for example, in classifying whether we, we have Right now, the, the phone is being carried with the person or not. These are categorical states. We're in this state or we're in that state, we pause it. Um, and we could qualify what is meant by on person. So for example, if it's in a handbag that's on my shoulder, is that on person? And I would, I would say yes for my interests uh, because it's being carried with me. Um, but um, the point is we could break it down to a small number of states. There's transitions amongst these states that we might posit. Um, maybe here we'll posit um, that there's a transition from off person to on person or on person to off person. You know, having the phone off my person, I can pick it up. That's going on this state. Having the phone on my person, there's some chance that I'll put it down, right? Um, in each of these states, there might be data that I get that would point me that would whisper to me about the underlying state. So here, for example, I might look at the acceleration profile of the phone. I might judge whether it's horizontal or not in some dichotomous way, um, or whether it's plugged in or not. Um, is it plugged into the wall? These are things we can pick up on Ethica. And we might have data on each of them. And I would argue that in each of these states, there's certain things we expect with respect to these measurements. For example, on person, I would expect my level of, the level of acceleration registered on the phone to be higher than if it were off person, with Andrew's phone possibly being accepted. Um, <laughs> uh, we've got to look into that. Um, um, so the acceleration profile that I'd expect on person and off person might be somewhat higher acceleration on person, but it's not always a lot higher. Uh, for example, if I'm standing to you, I'm talking to you at the end of the day, um, having 
expended a lot of my vital energy. Um, I might be quieter, and the acceleration profile will be quite low. And it might be similar to what I'd see, actually, if the phone was off person at certain times. Um, maybe the phone's off person, or I'm in a bus, and it's jiggling around, or I'm in a boat that's, you know, that's tossing in the waves of a, of a, a nor'easter. And uh, here, therefore, the acceleration measurements are themselves ambiguous. So given modest level of acceleration, well, it could come from a phone that's off person just in a noisy environment, or it could come from a, a phone that's on person where the person's being somewhat more quiescent. Phone, phone that's on person is less likely to be horizontal, completely horizontal than a phone uh, off person. A phone off person, um, many times it might be horizontal, but maybe it's in my backpack, right? Maybe it's, it's sitting on my backpack. It doesn't have to be horizontal. Um, maybe it's sitting on an angle on, on this, and it's not, not fully horizontal. So horizontal, if it's completely flat, it might clue us in that it's off person. But the fact that it's not horizontal is ambiguous, you know, as, as to which it's in. Is it plugged in? Well, there have been times on occasion, very rarely, where I have a phone on my person and it's plugged in, sitting in my lap, and, you know, it's plugged in. But for the most part, if it's plugged in, the balance of the time, it's, it's off person. So each of these states has certain characteristics to it in terms of what we expect to see from the world. Each of these states has, has some differences about sort of what the normal readings from the world would be. But any given reading is ambiguous. You see that. So if, if I were to tell you, well, there's a monosyllable of acceleration on the phone right now. And if you were to tell me that and you would say, I need to know whether that phone is on person or off person, I could give a guess, but it'd be a pretty fallible guess. You know, I'd say, yeah, it's, it's off person. But I might well be wrong from any one reading, from any one reading of any one of these. But jointly, they start to point to a situation that might be consistent. The phone is plugged in, perhaps. It is horizontal and it's moderate levels of acceleration. Well, on balance, I might think, hey, it's more likely to be off person. <coughs> but if I know the last 10 minutes, it's never been much acceleration that's been noted at all. It's been sitting flat like a lizard drinking all that time. And, and it's been plugged in all that time, I might think, Okay, it's increasingly likely it's off person. So, in short, what I'm proposing here is something that would look at this data, not in isolation, only acceleration, but look at multiple types of data. And more than that, look at data over time. If for the past eight hours, it has been horizontal, without any movement up from that, the chance that it's on person is very low. So that temporal context, tells me something. Why? Because, because we would expect some variation within, say, an on-person state uh, uh, within that course of time. Or maybe we're dealing with an outbreak. We have two states, uh, not in a foodborne illness outbreak or in a foodborne illness outbreak. Um, for a foodborne illness outbreak, we'd expect more clinical cases to present with highly credible gastrointestinal illness, HC, HCGI, compared with a non-outbreak state. In a non-outbreak state, we might see, for example, an average of somewhere in the low 20s of clinical cases, which have something like HCGI, um, whereas in an outbreak state, we might see something more in the 30s um, as a mean. But there's high variation for each of them. We could be in a non-outbreak state where just not many people are going out to dinner, not many people go to that restaurant, that vendor, um, and, um, and therefore it's a low number of cases. Similarly with subclinical illnesses, um, if uh, we could, or in individuals presenting mild symptoms, we could use them. And here, you know, we might posit there's some, some conditions under which an outbreak stops, a uh, restaurant is cleaned up, maybe it's found by an inspector, and in some cases where it goes into an outbreak state. And maybe, maybe there's actually a high overlap in some cases. The, 
the 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 um, distribution when it is an outbreak state um, in a in a non outbreak state are highly overlapped. So in outbreak state we have somewhat more cases on average, but anyone reading, let's say a reading of you know 65 is ambiguous. Are we in an outbreak state or not? Well, we could be on either one from that single reading. Okay, so we're going to try to formalize this notion with a hidden Markov model and talk about how it turns into quantitative estimates here. So there's a set of simplifications we're going to put in place. One is we have discrete states. I referred to this earlier. Categorical states, I said. Um, we have one of a, at any one time, we're in one of a small, uh, of a certain number of possibilities. Sometimes it's small, sometimes it's larger, you know, hundreds. But, um, but it's, a, it's a comparatively uh, limited number of, of discrete possibilities. It's not a continuous value. The states are treated as mutually exclusive and collectively exhausted. You're, you're in exactly one state at a time. Um, and collectively, they describe all possible states you can be in. An example here is, are we in a contaminated or non-contaminated state with respect to Saskatoon's um, uh, foodborne illness uh, situation? Is the phone our person, or is it the person sitting, standing, or lying down, or are they active? You might think of those as three, or a set of, of uh, mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive state. We're in exactly one at a time, and collectively, they're describing all possible situations we can be in. Okay, so one simplification is discrete states. I built that in from my description from the start. A second one is discrete time. So the idea here is we divide up time into equally sized time steps. Maybe each time step is one second when it comes to figuring out our posture or figuring out if the phone is in fact um, have a screen on or off. For each time step, we have exactly one observation of each type. So maybe the observation is, for example, um, we have for each second a record of, of uh, any battery records received and any screen state change records received, where it's a possibility we don't have any recording of that sort at all. And we treat that as a, as a null observation. It's, it's just another observation possible value. We don't have it. Okay. Uh, so we have a non, no observation category potentially for, for each of those. And, um, and um, generally speaking, you make the time step small enough that multiple observations within the time step is very unlikely. Um, and here, we, we treat it, we approximate it so that at any one time step, we consider the system as in exactly one state. Um, so if we consider my posture in one second time steps, there's going to be a few time steps where, or there's going to be some time steps where I'm transitioning, but we'll treat it as you know being in the state that I started in, and we view it as you know completely tolerable if if we um, view that from the standpoint of approximation as as being a situation where I'm in whatever the starting state was I was in there, we'll treat it as that being its defined state the amount of error that's going to be generated by, by um, assuming uh, we're in uh, exactly one state for each time step. It's so small, we're not worried about it. So we, we, for discrete time, we have this approximation that it's in exactly one state for that, uh, for that time step, and the transitions occur between time steps. So for this second, I'm standing, and this next second, I'm lying down. Okay. Okay, now, this is a somewhat more tricky assumption. Um, we treat states as being memoryless. It, the idea is that my chance of leaving the state is independent of how long they've been there, okay? Um, and if we want non-memoryless states, we can get it just by splitting states. So, you know, there's, I, I put down the phone, and within that time I put down the phone, there's a higher chance I'll, say, pick it up again within the five seconds after putting it down than there is, you know, an hour later. So we might have, you know, 
uh, a state where it's off person just after I transition to that state, and then a long period where it's um, um, where it's been down for a while. Um, and there there might be different chances of me picking it up again in each of those. Okay. Um, so the idea is these states are are it doesn't matter how long I've been there for my chance of leaving. It turns out that that may seem like a strong assumption, and it is a strong assumption, but it tends to distort the results minimally. So I'm not going to worry about it. It's also the same assumption that's in for system dynamics models and leaving a state. We assume your chance of leaving the state is independent of how long you've been there. Um, so it's, very, it's in common with system dynamics models. Okay. Um, now, observations. There's a, another simplification here. The idea is, look, if you're in a state where the probability that you'll observe something depends uh, only on, on you being in that state. Um, so, for example, maybe, um, maybe um, if I have a continuous uh, observation, let's suppose my blood pressure, maybe that depends on my posture. Um, uh, right now, and um, and then we assume within given a given posture, um, it just fluctuates at uh, within within some intervals within that according to a distribution, um, or um, for a discrete observation, an observation of a discrete quantity. Okay, the screen is turning on and the screen is turning off. It's a small number of possibilities, not a continuous value. Um, um, it might be. It might be something where we assume, okay, uh, we just have a certain probability of observing screen turning on when we're in the phone is off, uh, has the screen off as the underlying state, okay? Um, so the idea here is as long as we're in the state, successive observations, we'll treat them as independent. We'll treat them as, as not having high dependency between them. And if that, I, that observation last time while I'm in this state, I'm likely to have the same one again. Again, this is a strong assumption, but it tends to be very robust to this assumption in practice, HMMs. Um, so the idea here is, look, if I'm standing, uh, I have a certain distribution in terms of my accelerometry readings. And each successive accelerometer reading, we treat it as independent of the last one within this state. So if I'm standing now and I have an accelerometer reading, my accelerometer reading for the next second is fairly independent of my last one. That's that's probably an, that is an oversimplification, but it tends to be pretty innocuous uh, in practice in terms of how they how they succeed. The point here is that my reading from that accelerometer probably depends heavily on the state, but within a state, it's it varies in some range. Okay, so we formalize this HMM um, uh, in this sort of way. We have a set of states, S. This, so here, for example, I have a state I'm vaping, I'm smoking, or I'm not engaged in any use. Maybe those are my sets of states. That's my set of states, S, okay? Set of possible states. There's a set of possible observations. Um, and uh, here, maybe the observation is, for example, um, What's my level of um, of steps per per fifteen second interval, for example? Um, if I'm smoking and I'm vaping, uh, I might have a different distribution for the number of of steps per fifteen minute interval than if I'm engaged in no use. And similarly, the um, uh, the strength <laughs> of GPS signal might be different because with these two I'm more likely to be outside than for no use. So for each of those um, I'll have a set of observations and I'll, within each state I'll have a certain distribution for observing each observation. The next thing is there's this thing called the transition matrix. And basically what it describes is given where I'm at, and I'll go back to these ones we saw before, there's a certain chance that I'll, I'll leave per time step to go to any other state, and a certain chance I'll stay. So here, if I'm in the on-person state, and I consider a time step of a minute, let's say, in terms of 
we're considering where the phone is on one in minute intervals. Is it on person or off person? Is it on something I'm carrying or is it off? <coughs> we're considering on a minute basis. Maybe there's a 5% chance per minute that I'll go from on to off. And a 95% chance that if it's on person, I'll just keep it on my person. 95% chance I'll just keep it with me. Okay? On my person. By contrast, if it's off person, if it's sitting down here, maybe we pause it, there's a 20% chance I'll pick it up per minute, and an 80% chance it'll stay off person. We could flip those rounds and actually consider it what that would mean if it's 20% chance per minute, 0.2 per minute. The average amount of time I'd have it on uh, off, I, the, uh, it would be off person is one over that, which is one over 0.2 or five. Okay, so it's the reciprocal, <coughs> which is five. Um, is the average amount of time to be off person here? It'd be an average of 20 minutes, so that's one over 0.05 minutes that it would be on on person. So I carry it on average for 20 minutes before I put it down. That's what we're positing. Here, okay, and for each transition, we can define a, a value. And the transition, transition matrix basically codifies these values. It says, given what state I'm in, which is the rows, what's my probability of going to every other state, and including this one? What's the probability of just staying in the state? And it lists that out. Here we have two states. The probability of being um, uh, and if I'm an on person going to on person is 0.95, it's 95%, so it's 0.95 within the course of a minute. And the probability of going on person to off person is 0.05. The 0.95 and the 0.05 have to sum to 1. Similarly, for off person to on person, this is 0.2, and the chance of staying off person is 0.8. So I could draw this out in a matrix, which is, you know, a, a, a list systematically for each state I'm in, what's my probability of going to each other state, each state, okay? So that'll be the transition matrix that we're gonna be defining. Um, similarly, for this guy here, uh, we have these these uh, values. This is a, a larger one. And I've written the transition matrix up here. Okay, this is a transition matrix. We give it by the fancy name tau. Is it food time? It's food time. Okay. It's food time. Okay. Everybody needs a walk. Great. So um, we'll uh, we'll break in just a minute here. So, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen, here we have uh, the states. There are three states: vaping, no use, and smoking. And I've listed them out here. So this is a, we say a square matrix, meaning um, it has an equal number of rows and columns. Here are the rows. The first row says, I'm currently in the no use state. And the second row is for I'm currently in the smoking state. The third row is I'm currently in the vaping state. So if I'm currently in the no use state, my chance of going to the smoking state is 0 0.003 per second, okay? Oh, sorry, one minute, up there, one minute. So that's why this entry is 0 0.003. If I'm in no use, my chance in the next minute of going through the smoking state, of starting smoking, is 0 0.003. Um, uh, similarly, my chance of going to vaping is 0 0.007, that's along this arrow here. And if you total those up, total up, you get 1%, and thus my chance of staying in the no use state, I could show it with a little loop, but I didn't, is 99%, it's 0.99, okay? And if I'm in the smoking state, here we are, my chance of going to the no use state is 0.18 per minute, is the idea. Um, and that will yield an average time smoking of slightly over five minutes. My chance of going here to the smoking state, or staying in the smoking state is 0.8. My chance of going to the vaping state is 0.02. While I'm in the smoking state, maybe I'll switch to vape, okay? And that's 0.0, uh, 0.02. There should be a little arrow. It's a little head of the arrow is cut off. So these all sum to one. These all sum to one on a row. Each of the rows sums to one. And basically this summarizes 
what's my chance of going to the other state? Now, you may wonder where do these numbers come from? Well, with the hidden Markov model, we will deduce these numbers generally. We will infer these numbers. We will say what values for these numbers would make it most likely that we've observed this data. And that's what the machine learning does. It infers these numbers and it also infers what the distributions are within each state within limits often. Okay? That's one major use of HMMs is figuring out what is the chance per minute we'll be going for that. For this person, what's their chance of starting vaping whilst they're smoking? Or starting smoking whilst they're vaping? Or what's their chance of vaping compared to smoking if they haven't been using at all? We infer these things from large volumes of data. And we have a profile that comes out of it for a given person. What's their mode of operation? Okay? Um, this is what's part of what's going to come out of the, uh, the HMM. So, so that's a transition matrix. And then for each of these states, we're going to have some probability of observing something. Um, so in the case, for example, back here of non-outbreak and outbreak, whilst we're in this non-outbreak state, we'll have a certain chance of observing a, a, a number of clinical cases compared to an outbreak. Outbreak, we'd expect more clinical cases, and we'll, we'll have a distribution associated with that. And for many applications of hidden Markov models, not all, we will estimate this distribution. Okay, we'll try to figure out that distribution. Okay, so um, uh, that's that's a, another use which it, is common in HMM, um, common in HMMs. Although many HMMs don't try to do that, uh, they focus on other things. Now, why are we doing this? Why are we interested in specifying these things, these states, these transitions, these, these uh, uh, probabilities? Well, it's going to allow us to know at a certain time, for example, right now, or w this week historically, was there an outbreak? Were we in this state or this state at that time? Or for a given period of time, was that person smoking? Or was that person vaping? It's going to allow us to estimate by looking at the data, not just how often they transition, but right now is this person smoking or is this person vaping? Why might we be interested in doing that? Maybe we want to send them a message. Maybe we want to encourage them to quit smoking. Maybe we want to show them a picture of your mother and of their mother and say, you know, <laughs> what would she think? Um, <laughs> get that cancer stick out of your mouth or something like that, right? Um, so the point is recognizing whether someone's engaged in a given activity now or how much time they've likely been engaged in that activity can be useful. If you're, if you're working with a veteran who's struggling with opioid dependence, for example, maybe you want to have some understanding of the likely, the likelihood that he, uh, he's spending, spending time um, uh, using, using opioids and you want to spot when he's likely in a state of, of um, having just used opioids or what have you. Um, maybe we want to know is a person driving or not with a phone, right? And we want to restrict what's shown to them on the phone so if they're driving we don't distract them. Maybe we prevent them from engaging in texting behavior when they're driving and we have two states driving and not driving and we classify when they're in the driving state. All sorts of use for this once you start thinking about knowing what is the true underlying situation. The challenge here that I've been alluding to is that any one of these of these bits of evidence, any one of these um, types of input we may measure is ambiguous. And so the hidden Markov model is going to give us, the algorithms are going to give us a way to put all of these together, all these different types of measurements, and take into account the regularities of the fact that you're unlikely to be driving now and one second later not driving and then going back to driving again. You, there's a certain slow slowness of transitions between these things to make to, to point with great clarity as to what the true underlying situation is right now. 
And the true underlying situation right don't worry. now is. Don't worry, you have five more minutes because oh. they're cleaning the machine before we use it. Oh, okay. <laughs> five more minutes. That, that's, that's great. Um, thank you. So, um, so, so, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be. We're going to be using all these sort of assumptions here about, about uh, a hidden Markov model to figure out what's going on at a certain time, how much time are people spending in certain states, how frequently are transitioning. In short, back to that questions, those research questions addressed. These are our quarry. And all we have to do is, is, is apply these algorithms um, uh, and, and conceptualize the situation and apply these algorithms uh, and we can gain answers to these sort of questions. Okay? Um, so that's our goal with an HMM. Now, in order to illustrate that, I provided an example uh, here. So imagine that there are occurrences of outbreaks and there's some periods with outbreak, uh, outbreaks. And we know that periods with outbreaks tend to have higher incident case counts for reported illness. And we're interested in knowing at a given time is there is there an outbreak? So to keep this very simple, I imagine two states, an outbreak and a non-outbreak state. Now, um, here we may anticipate that in an outbreak state, we have somewhat more cases than a, a non-outbreak state. That's why in a non-outbreak state, this distribution associated with that tends to have its peak, for example, and generally be shifted to lower values. So here, incident cases somewhere around maybe 13 or 14 on average, but in, a, in, in an outbreak state, the number of incident cases per week here uh, might be 20 to 25, okay? Um, these these uh, overlap quite a bit. So if we have 20 cases, for example, noted, it could just be an unlucky non-outbreak week, or it could be a quite lucky outbreak week, right? Um, if we have 15 cases, it's much more likely we're in a non-outbreak state than an outbreak state. Now, I'm going to assume for the sake of presenting this as if we know these distributions, but I'll describe later how we deduce these distributions or how you'll deduce these transitions. But you can imagine if we take a stance, this transition occurs with 90% chance per week, this transition with 30% chance per week. In other words, a non-outbreak, an outbreak tends to at end on average in a week, and a non-outbreak tends to lead to an outbreak state once every three, three to three and a half weeks, three, you know, three and a third weeks on average. If we were to posit this as the, as the underlying situation, we could assess using that, what's likely going on in certain states. And the, the way that we're going to do this is to reason about the underlying state. So, so we're going to be saying, okay, uh, we have state one and state two. State one is outbreak, state two is non-outbreak. Okay, um, and we're going to assume, initially we'll guess that we start with uh, probability 75% probability in an outbreak state and 25% in a non-outbreak state. And then each week, we have a certain chance we'll switch, right? So if we're in the non-outbreak state, with 30% chance within the course of a given week, so that's why we're in this column, non-outbreak, and there's a 30% chance per week that we'll switch to this state. That's why there's this this probability of 0.3 here. On the other hand, if we are, we're in that non-outbreak state, this is 70% chance we'll stay in this non-outbreak state, okay? And what's being shown here is one example trajectory, okay? So here's an example trajectory. We start in a non-outbreak state. Uh, we, we go successive weeks in an outbreak state, and then we switch to a non-outbreak state uh, again. And what I'm showing you in the middle column here is an indication of the distribution. Given that we're in a non-outbreak state, for example, excuse me, uh, uh, yes, a non-outbreak, uh, excuse me here, this is, okay, um, 10, 20, 40, okay, so these are, so actually this is non-outbreak and this is outbreak in terms of how it's labeled with the distributions here. But you'll notice 
Uh, when we're in an outbreak state, we have a higher number of cases on average than, than when we're in a non-outbreak state. Um, and the number of observations um, hints as to that, but is not definitive. So for example, in an outbreak state, we might have 31 observations. In a non-outbreak state, for example, 16, 10 here, 15, and then uh, we're back in an outbreak state, we're more likely to have 26 and then 20. But a given measurement, say 20, is again quite ambiguous. We could be very unlucky on outbreak state or very lucky uh, outbreak state. So over time, we're going to assume there's some underlying situation. We just don't know what it is, and we want to infer it. We want to deduce it. We want to take these measurements, each of which is very ambiguous, and we want to try to infer that's what was going on at that time with a certain probability. Okay. Um, now, the idea is we can, we can engage in um, positing some underlying situation. Like here, we, we say this is what we think the underlying situation is. These are the distributions. These are the, these are the chances of switching between states. But for a given positing of that, we could ask, what's the likelihood that that model, if this were the case, if this were the true underlying situation, what's the likelihood that it would explain the data we see empirically? What's the, what's the likelihood that the data would come out of a situation like this? If this is what the true underlying situation is, how likely is it we'd observe the sort of data we do observe from the world? That's what we're going to be able to assess with some of these tools. And that will actually allow us to pick plausible models, models which are more in line with the data, models that posit things that are more plausible with regards to the data. For those familiar with dynamic modeling, this is a bit like calibrating. We're a bit aligning our assumptions about how frequently outbreaks occur, how quickly they end, or the number of cases that come during an outbreak or not to align with what we observe from data in the world. And the way in which we do this with hidden Markov models traditionally is a process known as MLE estimation, or maximum likelihood estimation. We're going to adjust our assumptions so that, that they make the sequence we observe most plausible, most likely to have occurred. So rather than assuming something, for example, our outbreaks are very few and far between, we'll be assuming a, a level of outbreaks that are consistent with the types of observations we note in our data. So a key step towards this is to find a model that, um, find the likelihood that a given model would produce the observed data. And we'll see that after the break. Okay, so uh, I think the machine is clean. Um, they, they've averted the risk of any outbreak state. There will be no outbreaks. That's great. Um, uh, during, during, I'll share with you, during our, so I, I run several boot camps a year. We have an agent-based modeling boot camp which we run every year in August for many years. And um, during, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, again, but during that outbreak, <laughs> uh, during that outbreak, during that boot camp um, this summer, um, we couldn't go to our normal uh, venue every day. And so we went to um, a couple of different venues, some of which were very nice, but one of them was, uh, one of which was, was Louis, uh, which is kind of a, uh, a pub bar, um, kept located underground. Um, <laughs> Jeff took me aside after we went there and said, you know, he didn't think it was an uplifting, um, an uplifting location. He said he, he thinks he says it has a bit of a seedy feel to it. He said he, he thinks it's been stained by a few too many bodily fluids. And so he said. Uh, you know, probably it's not a good venue, but we we did go there, and then within the next day. or later that day, yeah. I think a large like four people, at least four people, four or five I'm people sure. reported gastrointestinal distress. Yeah. <laughs> and, 
And so we we deduced um, with, without even running the algorithms. <laughs> we deduced that Louis was probably in an outbreak state, yes. and we subsequently avoided us. We um, went to a much well, better lit. Yeah. No, that's not causally directly connected with why we're offering this in the hotel. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I wanted but to keep you out of this. It was so. a consideration. Okay, so we'll come back after, uh, and we'll see how these models support this sort of inferencing about the values uh, assumed in these models and how they allow us to do what's likely going on at any one time. Are we in an outbreak now or not? But I can assure you, there's no outbreak. Okay, thank you.